Okay. So here's what's and I'm I'll show you the equation of a wave and explain to you how to use it. But before I do that, I should explain what it even mean to have a wave equation. What does it mean that a wave can have the equation? Here's what it means. I think you've got a water wave instead of this. We graph the vertical height of the water wave as a function of the position. So for instance, if you go walk out of here, you go look at the water wave heading toward the shore. So the wave might move like this, you see this wave moving towards the shore. Now realistically water waves, I know we don't really look like this, but this is the mathematically simplest way you can describe. So we're gonna start with this simple one as a starting point. So let's say this is your wave, you go walk out on the pier and you go stand at this point at a point right in front of you, you see that the water height is high, and then one meter to the right of you, the water level is zero. And then two meters to the right of you, the water height, the water level is negative three. What does that mean? It means that if it was a nice day out, right, there's no waves whatsoever. There should be a flat ocean or lake wherever you're standing. But if there's waves, that water level should be higher than that position or lower than that water level position. We'll just call this water level position zero, where the water would normally be if there were no waves. So you grab this thing, you get this graph like this, which is really just a snapshot because this is vertical height versus horizontal position. It's really just a picture. So in other words, I could just fill this in with water, and I'd be like, oh yeah, that's what the wave looks like at that moment in time. And if I were to show what the wave does, it travels toward the shore like this, and you can see it moves. So that's that's what this graph really is. If you've got a height versus position, you've really got a picture or a snapshot of what the wave looks like at all horizontal positions at one particular moment in time. And so what should our equation be? It should be an equation for the vertical height of the wave that's at least a function of the position. So this is function of, this isn't multiplied by, but this y should at least be a function of the position so that I get a function where I can plug in any position I want. Let's say x equals zero, and it should tell me, oh yeah, that's at three. So this equation equation should spit out three when I plug in x equals zero. When I plug in x equals one, it should spit out, oh, that's at zero. So it should give me a y value of zero. And if I were to plug in x value of six meters, it should tell me, oh yeah, that y value is negative three. So no matter what x I plug in here, say seven, it should tell me what the value of the height of the rate is at that horizontal position. So what would this equation look like? Well, let's just try to figure out why should equal as a function of x. It should be no greater than three or negative three, and this is called the amplitude. So if we call this here the amplitude a, it's going to be no bigger than that amplitude. So in this case, the amplitude would be three, but I'm just going to write amplitude. So this is a general equation that can apply it anyway. And then look at the shape of this. This is like a sine or a cosine graph. Which one is this? Well, because at x equals zero, it starts at a maximum. I'm going to say this is most like a cosine graph because cosine of zero starts at a maximum value. So I'm going to say that this is like cosine of some stuff in here. Now you might be tempted to just write x. That's not going to work. If I just wrote x in here, this wouldn't be general enough to describe anyway. Because think about it. If I've just got x, cosine of x will reset every time x gets to two pi. So every time the total inside here gets to two pi, cosine resets. But look at this cosine. It resets after four meters. And some other wave might reset after eight meters. Some other wave might reset after a different distance. I need a way to specify in here how far you have to travel in the x direction for the wave to reset. So x alone isn't going to do it because if you just got x, it always resets after two pi. So what do I do? I play the same game that we played for some more amount of oscillators, and I say that this is two pi, and I divide by not the period this time. This is not a function of time, it's not yet. It's not a function of time, this is just of x. So this wouldn't be the period. This would not be the time it takes for this function to reset. It would actually be the distance that it takes for this function to reset. In other words, what we call the wavelength. So the distance between two peaks the wavelength and we represent it with this Greek letter lambda. So the distance it takes away to reset in space is the wavelength. That's what we would divide by because that has units of meters. And then finally we would multiply by x in here. That way, if I started x equals zero, because I started at a maximum, I would get three. If I say that my x has gone all the way to one wavelength, and in this case it's four meters, so all the way to four meters to one wavelength, once I plug in wavelength for x, that wavelength would cancel this wavelength, we get two pi, and this cosine would reset because once the total inside becomes two pi, the cosine would reset. And that's what happens for this wave. It should reset after every wavelength. You go another wavelength, it resets, another wavelength, it resets, and that's what would happen here. So how do we apply this wave equation to this particular wave? Well, let's take this. I already got cosine, so that's cool. We should have this here. You can use sine if your wave started at this point and went up from there, but ours starts at a maximum, so we'll use cosine. So we'll say that our amplitude, not just A, our amplitude happens to be three meters because our water gets as high as three meters above the equilibrium level. And we'll leave cosine here. The two pi stays, but the lambda does not. Our wavelength is not just lambda, that's just too general. We've got to write what it is. It's the distance from peak to peak, which is four meters, or you can measure it from trough to trough, or you can call these valleys valley to valley. That'll also be four meters, regardless of how you measure it, the wavelength. Is four meters. And then what do I plug in for x? I don't, because I want a function. This is a function of x. I mean, I can plug in values of x. Let's just actually let's do it. Let's see if this function works. If I leave it as just x, it's a function. It tells me the height of the wave at any point x. But we should go and test it. Let's test if it actually works. So let's take x and let's just plug in zero. So plug in zero for x. What does this function tell me? It tells me that the cosine of all of this would be zero. And I know cosine of zero is just one. So tell me that this whole function is going to equal three meters. That's true. The height of this wave at x equals zero. So at x equals zero, the height of the wave is three meters. So that one worked. Let's try to let's say we plug in a horizontal position of two meters. We're plugging two meters over here and then plug in two meters over here. What do I get? It's going to be three meters times cosine of, well, two times two is four, over four is one, times pi, so the cosine of just pi. And the cosine of pi is negative one, so we get negative three out of this. Negative three meters, and that's true. The height of this wave at two meters is negative three meters, so this function is telling us the height of the wave at any horizontal position x, which is pretty cool. However, you might have spotted a problem. It might be like, wait a minute, that's fine and all, but this is for one moment in time. This wave is moving. Remember, this whole wave moves toward the shore. So at a particular moment in time, yeah, this equation might give you what the wave shape is for all values of x. But if I wait for the moment move, now everything's messed up. Now at x equals two, the height is not negative three. And at x equals zero, the height is no longer three meters. It only goes up to here now. So what do we do? How do we describe a wave that's actually moving to the right in a single equation? Well, it's not as bad as you might think. Let me get rid of this. Let's clean this up. We're really just going to build off of this function over here. What I really need is a wave equation that's not only a function of x, but that's also a function of time. So this function up here has to not just be a function of x. It's got to also be a function of time. So I can plug it any time at any position, and it would tell me what the value of the height of the wave is. So how do I get the time dependence in here? Well, I'm going to ask you to remember
So we're not going to add, we've got a wave going to the right. We're going to want to subtract a certain amount shifted here. But subtracting a certain amount, so that's cool, because subtracting a certain amount shifts the wave to the right. But if I just if I just had a constant shifted here, I wouldn't do it. Like the wave at the beach does not just move to the right and the boom just stops. That just keeps moving. We need a wave that keeps on shifting. So you might realize, be clever, you'd be like, wait, why don't I just make this phase shift dependent on time? That way, as time keeps increasing, the wave is going to keep on shifting more and more. So if this, if this wave shift term kept getting bigger as time got bigger, your wave would keep shifting to the right. You have an equation that describes a wave that's actually moving. So what would you put in here? I see daunting. I might be like, man, it's going to be complicated. How do we figure that out? But it's not too bad because just like the wavelength is the distance it takes for the wave to reset, there's also something called the period. We represent that with capital T. And the period is the time it takes for the wave to reset. So if I wait one whole period, this wave will have moved in such a way that it gets right back to where you couldn't really tell. It looks like the exact same wave, in other words. So we show that over here. See, so you have a water wave up here. I take this wave. You wait one whole period, the wave will have shifted right back and it looks like it did just before. So that whole wave is moving toward the beach. Close your eyes and then open it one period later, the wave looks exactly the same. So we can use that fact up here. We need this function to reset. Not just after a wavelength, we need it to reset after a period as well. So how do we represent that? We play the exact same game. We say that all right, we can't just put time in here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put two pi over the period, capital T, and then I multiply by the time. That way, just like every time x went through a wavelength, every time we walk one wavelength along the pier, we see the same height because this becomes two pi. Every time we wait one whole period, this becomes two pi, and this whole thing's gonna reset again. So this is the wave equation, and I guess we can make it a little more general. This cosine could have been sine, so if you end up with a wave, it's better described with a sine maybe starts here and goes up. You might want to use sine. And the negative, remember the negative caused this wave to shift to the right. You use negative or positive because it can shift. Right with the negative, or if you use the positive, adding the shift term, shifts the left. So a positive term up here would describe a wave moving to the left. And technically speaking, you can make it just slightly more general by having one more constant phase shift term over here to the right. If you add this, then we can take into account cases that are weird where maybe the graphs are falling here, and neither starts as a sine or a cosine. You have to draw a shift by just a little bit. But in our case right here, you don't worry about it because it started at maximum, so you wouldn't have to have that phase shift. And this is it. This is the wave equation. This is what we wanted a function of position time. It tells you the height of the wave at any position x or its own position x at any time t. So let's try to apply this formula to this particular wave we've got right here. So we get rid of this, right? This was this was just the expression for the wave at one moment in Time. So maybe this picture that we took of the wave at the pier was at the moment, let's call it t equals zero seconds. So t equals zero seconds, we took this picture, that's what the wave looks like, and this is the function that describes what the wave looks like at that moment in time. We're going to do better now. Now we're going to describe what the wave looks like for any position x and any time t. So let's do this. What would the amplitude be? That's easy. It's still three. The wave never gets any higher than three. Never gets any lower than negative three, so our amplitude is still three meters. And since at x equals zero and t equals zero, our graph starts at maximum, we're still going to want to use cosine. So we come in here, two pi x over lambda, well, the lambda is still lambda, so lambda here is still four meters, because it took four meters for this graph to reset. You had to walk four meters along the meter to see this graph reset. That's a little misleading. You have to run really fast. The wave is going to be as you're walking. So I should say, if you're standing zero and a friend you're just standing four, you would both see the same height because the wave resets at four meters. Would we want positive or negative? Since this wave is moving to the right, we would want that negative. I wouldn't need a phase shift term because this is the start of the perfect cosine. It doesn't start some weird in-between function. The only question is, what am I plugging for the period? So I would need one more piece of information. If I'm told the period, that'd be fine. Sometimes questions are trickier than that. Maybe they tell you this wave is traveling to the right at 0.5 meters per second. Let's say that's the wave speed. And you're asked, create a equation that describes the wave as a function of space and time. So you do all this, but then you'd be like, how do I find the period? We have to use the fact that remember the speed of a wave is either written as wavelength times frequency, or you can write it as wavelength over period. If I solve for the period, I say that the period of this wave, if I'm given the speed and the wavelength, I can find the wavelength on this graph, I say the period of the wave would be the wavelength divided by the speed. So our wavelength was four meters and our speed, let's say we were just told that it was 0.5 meters per second, would give us a period of eight seconds. So we have to plug in eight seconds over here for the period. And there it is. That's my equation for this wave. This describes, this whole equation is amazing. It describes the height of this wave at any position x and any time t. So in other words, I can plug in three meters for x and 5.2 seconds for the time. And it would tell me what's the height of this wave at three meters at the time, 5.2 seconds, which is pretty amazing. So we got, I mean, this is the wave equation that describes the height of the wave for any position x and time t. You would use the negative sign if the wave is moving to the right, and the positive sign if the wave is moving to the left. I want to show you the equation of a Okay. Um, a couple of things. I guess one is that's really a. I'm going to turn on the lights here. That's really a solution to the wave equation. You know, the wave equation, or what we call a wave, been calling a wave equation, is this partial differential equation. And we looked at it actually in chapter one for acoustic wave. He's looking at water waves here. Of course, we're looking at um, electrical waves, wave voltages, and current waveforms at this point in our transmission lines. And then so, uh, you know, he had an expression for the amplitude of the wave as a function of x, and it was cosine at 2 pi over lambda x minus 2 pi over t times t, and then plus some phase shift. Now, this is close to the expression we've been using. It's a little different. We've been talking about propagation in the z direction, right? So 
that's one change. And we've also written this a little differently, but you remember cosine of minus theta is cosine of theta. So we've actually, you know, let me rewrite this as a voltage. We've actually been taking the negative of this, two pi over t, t minus two pi over lambda z. And then I'll, I'll put in, um, call this, the phi is just the negative side. We've just been writing it like that with a positive phase angle. But the phase angle could be positive or negative. And then uh, some other things. So, but this the, the, this is still a solution to the wave equation, and this is close to what we've been doing. But then we've also been two pi over t is two pi one over t is f two pi f is omega. So we've been using omega for two pi over capital T. Remember what two pi over lambda is. That's actually the wave number or the, the propagation constant, beta. Okay. So beta is, so if you know lambda, you know beta. Okay. Again, if you know the period, you know f, you know omega too. Okay. So they just differ by all that two pi constant. So this is the form of the wave equation that we've been using in the textbook for our Voltages actually, we've generalized it a little bit more because, at least now, what we've been working with most recently, and this is true certainly of water waves or any sort of mechanical wave or certainly acoustic waves, that as they travel, the amplitude decays, right? If it didn't decay, you know, you could be speaking to someone who's a mile away, they could hear you, but you know, that amplitude decays, it falls off the distance. So we actually have a, an exponent in e to the minus alpha z term in here to say that the amplitude then, which would be a e to the minus alpha z, that's how we model the amplitude getting smaller. So instead of, you know, if you, if you map this thing as a function of z, instead of having a constant amplitude like this, again, this is a picture at a single instant in time. It is moving to the right. But you know, call this at t equals zero. But more generally, the amplitude is, is decreasing. I mean, I'm you know, I'm exaggerating the amplitude decrease here. You know, over 10 meters of cable, you probably you're not going to notice much of an amplitude decrease. But over a thousand meters of cable, you will. Okay. So, but I'm exaggerating it here to, to to just emphasize that the amplitude is, is uh, decreasing rapidly. So I put a link to that video up on the website if you wanna um, look at that at, at normal speed if it was a little too fast. But, so I wanna continue this discussion of, of transmission lines today um, and talk particularly about coax and microstrip, but let's, let's review a little bit. The other thing that we've been doing is instead of working in the time domain, we've been working in the phaser domain. And the phaser corresponding to this would be the amplitude, you really get rid of the time dependence, you get rid of the omega t part. And what's left becomes the, the phaser angle. Again, it's a complex number. So the, the corresponding phaser here would just be a function of, of z, it's no longer a function of t. And in this case, it would be minus j, to, j beta z is minus d, so I get the plus sign back. And that would be. You know, that's a complex number. Now it's a complex number that changes with position. Okay. So, you know, he drew this in the video, he drew this cosine as a function of z, but I could really at any point 
any distance, I could draw a picture at that point with what I see as a function of time. So now I'm fixed. You know, I'm, I'm riding on a, a raft or something. I'm going up and down. I've got sinusoidal motion with time at a fixed point. So I could pick any point, like here at the origin as well. You know, and I'm, I'm going to get the same cosine, okay, same amplitude. But here, this is lambda. This, you know, if I'm stopped in time, sitting there on a raft or something going up and down, the, the, what I measure is the time distance between, you know, when I reach the peak and go back up and down. And that's the period. So it's, you know, it's a sinusoidal oscillation in both distance at any instant in time and at any dense distance, it's a function of time. And if, you, if you're standing there looking at it, it appears, and it is, you know, that the crest of this waveform is actually moving you know, away from the disturbance if, it, if it's a water wave. So again, it's, it's a little easier. The math is a lot easier. Um, if we work in the phasor domain, just like it is for circuits, then it is if we work directly in the time domain, we, we can avoid differential equations in the phasor domain. You have to deal with complex numbers. And complex numbers aren't easy, but they're a lot easier than differential equations. So, so we've been writing. So I could add on to this, you know, more generally, this is a right propagating wave. I could have a left propagating wave. And again, as he said in the video, you just have to change the sign. And that would be a, a, a wave propagating in the negative Z direction. So generally on our transmission lines, we have so <clears throat> this is the phaser. Again, gamma here is complex, so it's got the J beta. Because it's complex, gamma is alpha plus J beta. It gives me the E to the minus alpha, the decaying part, as well as the oscillation with distance. They're all tied up into this gamma term, right? E to the minus gamma Z is E to the minus alpha plus J beta Z. Alpha and beta are the imaginary parts, are the real and imaginary parts of gamma by definition. If you have gamma, you have alpha and beta. But I can write this as e to the minus alpha z, e to the minus j beta z. This is my complex sinusoid. This represents the attenuation of the amplitude uh, with distance. So it's all right there that, that <clears throat> um, amplitude decay, if alpha has a real part, we'll look at some little loss transmission line where alpha is essentially zero. And there you're just saying that the amplitude of the wave doesn't decrease. And then beta is directly tied to the wavelength. Okay, so this e to the minus gamma z, that has our alpha part, that has our beta part, in general, this V0 plus can be com is a complex number, no longer a function of distance, but V0 plus can be a complex number. It has an amplitude and a phase, okay? It would be V0 plus a magnitude e to the j p, okay? And that would give us that, that angle. So this is the right propagating wave. We'll see, we're not quite there yet. We'll get there next time where we have on our transmission line can have a right propagating wave and then due to an echo or reflection will also have at the same time a left propagating wave and things really get interesting there because you get constructive and destructive interference between those two waves. So this is, this is now our phaser and we can go back from this and certainly it's straightforward to go between these two representations. 
But now I, this part represents another term on here with a plus beta c, the left propagating wave, where again, gamma is alpha plus j beta. And we can calculate gamma. And this came from, we actually started from you know, a model for our transmission line, this RLC model, had a conductance in there. And you know, converted it into a differential equation. And surprisingly, that differential equation was the wave equation, the exact same differential equation that describes acoustic wave propagation as well as wave propagation in water. Okay. What's different there is the phase velocity and all those different media. In free space, our voltage waves travel at the speed of light. We've seen in transmission lines, it's slower than that, but very fast, close to the speed of light. Whereas mechanical waves, acoustic waves are much, much, much slower. I forget what the speed of uh, uh, speed of uh, sound is. It seems like 700 something feet per second, but that, I don't know, maybe meters per second. Um, but it's much slower than the speed of light. So that's our expression for gamma that comes from this model for our transmission lines. And you can look these parameters up. I mean, you can go, you can Google for coax of RG59 cable, and you'll find those values for L prime. This is inductance per meter, capacitance per meter, resistance per meter, and then this is conductance per meter. Okay, it's, it's, it's the conductance between the two conductors. This is the resistance of the to of the conductor. Okay, so ideally with a with a low loss transmission line, R prime is zero and G prime is zero. Okay, you've got a perfect conductor. You want G prime to be zero, which would mean the, the resistance between your two conductors is infinite. But a conductance of zero gives you a resistance of infinity, right? Resistance is one over conductance. So ideally, you don't want leakage between those two separated conductors. And then similarly, we found that our current has exactly the same form. And this, these are actually solutions to the wave equation, which is what he, he was talking about in the video, the video. He called it the wave equation. But the wave equation is this differential equation. So, but we found that I and Z are related by the characteristic impedance. And just like when you're working circuits. That's why we take this approach with the phasers because we hope everyone's familiar with, with working with, with phasers and circuits. That the um, right traveling current wave is the right traveling voltage wave divided by the characteristic impedance. And the right traveling, the left traveling current wave is the right traveling current is the left traveling current the voltage wave divided by the negative of the characteristic impedance. The negative sign is here because if you look at the model, the model we used, we define current going to the right. So the minus here means at least that this current is going in the opposite direction. Where the characteristic impedance again is function of our transmission line parameters. And this is, this is typically a complex value. It's a function as is this complex co uh, propagation constant gamma. Typically, they're both functions of frequency. You see that wrapped up in there with, with, the, with the omega. Okay. 
So this is that's the these are the more general results, and, and this whole chapter kind of builds on on this, and we'll certainly continue this discussion next time, where we start then adding in this reflected wave, you know, and we get this this echo from the end of the transmission line. Now I think in some of the some of the problems, um, homework problems, he may mention mention that the transmission line is infinitely long. At this point, that means that we just have a right propagating wave that there is no boundary to reflect from. Okay. So um, next time, we'll start talking about transmission lines that have a certain length. Okay. They're, they end, they're connected to a, a load, and we can get a reflection from that, from that load. But in trans lossless transmission lines, ideally, R prime is zero, G prime is zero. Again, they're not the same resistance. R prime represents the, the, the resistance of the conductors themselves, the series resistance per length. And G prime is the conductance between the two conductors. But ideally, those are both zero. Zero resistance along my conductor infinite resistance between my two conductors, ideally. Practically, all we really need is R prime to be much, much less than J omega L prime, and G prime to be much, much less than J omega C prime, to get simplifications in terms of gamma and our characteristic impedance. As you can kind of see what happens, well, certainly if I go back to gamma, if R prime is zero, this is just J omega L prime. If G prime is zero, this is just J omega C prime. Okay, so in that case, I've got the square root of, I'll have J omega squared times LC. So in this lossless transmission line, gamma, would be the square root of J omega squared L prime C prime or J omega square root of L prime C prime. Now, you know, in the general case, alpha gamma is complex, okay, has real imaginary parts. We see in this lossless transmission line case that Gamma, though, is entirely imaginary, right? L and C are both positive real numbers. L prime C prime are both positive real numbers. Omega is a positive number. So this is entirely imaginary. There is no real part. So what that, what that means in the Wassel's transmission line case is that alpha is zero. There is no, I ever write that down over here somewhere? I thought I had an E to the somewhere, but there is no attenuation with distance. There is no E to the minus alpha Z term. So in this lossless transmission line, what I'm really saying is that my voltage amplitude and my current amplitudes never decay, never decrease. Okay. Again, this is, this is an approximation. It's valid for you know, transmission, unless my transmission lines get miles and miles long. Then it's, then it's no longer a good uh, uh, approximation. Um, and then beta is omega square root of L prime C prime. Remember, beta is not, beta, alpha and beta are both real numbers. Beta is the imaginary part of gamma, but the imaginary part of a complex number doesn't include the J. So beta is just omega prime Omega times square root of L, L prime C prime. Our phase velocity is omega over beta, or it's just one over the square root of L prime C prime. And then for the RG59, 
uh, coaxial cable. We looked at this last time. That turned out to be two times 10 to the eighth, pretty close to that, that particular coaxial cable. Now, um, so it's about two thirds the speed of light. Now, you also have to, I guess it's not really necessary, but this doesn't mean that electrons, for example, are moving at that rate. This, this means that points in our wave are moving at that rate, like the crest is moving. So, you know, if, if you look at um, um, uh, um, vibration of a string, the material in the string is moving, right? It's fixed in space. It's just the wave amplitude that's moving. Or another example I've heard to explain it is how the phase propagation can be much, much greater than the actual electron velocity, which, which can be actually relatively slow, much, much slower than the speed of light. Because if you think about having a tube that's full of ping pong balls, you know, if you, sh if you shove a new ping pong ball uh, on one end, the other one pops out immediately, okay? But, you know, if you do that with several ping pong balls, the ping, ball, ping pong balls themselves are moving down the tube relatively slowly. But you see the effect almost instantaneously as how that force propagates down the tube. So that's kind of what's going on here. You get these variations in voltage and current that are propagating to, you know, in a, in a direction, you know, at a, at a high rate. But the electrons actually in the, in the, in the medium are, are moving relatively slowly. And then uh, we also, get an approximation for, which is nice, for the characteristic impedance. When R prime and G prime are zero, the J omega is actually canceled out, right? And so the characteristic impedance in the lossless transmission line case is just the square root of L prime over C prime, which is an entirely real number. Again, in the general case, the characteristic impedance is complex, but in this, approximate case where we, where we can treat the transmission line as lossless. And, and often in practice, you'll make this assumption, even if the transmission line is not truly lossless, you'll base your calculations on having a, a real Z0 and then gamma just, just being beta, and then you'll add an uh, attenuation constant into the equations kind of at the end. Okay, so if, whether that's really valid or not, it, it's a pretty good approximation. But um, you often make this lossless transmission line assumption, um, whether it's completely valid or, or not. So any questions on any of this so far? Okay. It's, it can be an overwhelming number of equations and variables and what's complex and you know how they're all related. I'll try to give you a summary sheet um, of all of these things. This is the first time I've, again, I've used this book, the first time that actually we covered transmission lines in this course. So I don't have a, a pre-made sheet uh, of equations for you yet. So let's look at, let's look at coax. And I'm going to show a cross section of it. Okay, there's there's an inner conductor and an outer conductor. The radius of the inner conductor we're going to call a, little a. The distance from the center of the coax to the outer conductor we call b. And then in between there's dielectric or non-conducting material. We like to be fancy, so often instead of saying non-conducting, we'll say dielectric material. So this is often, you know, if you look at coax, it looks like it appears to be some sort of foam. You know, it's, it's, it's not hard plastic so that you can bend the cable. 
but uh, you know, it appears to be it's polyethylene usually is the chemical substance. Okay. So um, in the book, he calls this space the material and use the corresponding um, subscript S to represent the space or material. But typically in coax, the permeability is of the spacer material is about the same as the permeability of free space. And then the permittivity is a little higher than the permittivity of free space. Again, here for permeability, you can say the relative permeability of the spacer material is one. Right? For the permittivity, ER is the relative uh, permittivity. And this is in ferrets per meter, but typically the relative permeability is between one and three, right? depending on the coaxial material, the type of material. The, depending on the, the type of space and material. And then the other quantity we need is actually the conductivity of the space and material. That's going to be re directly related to our G prime constant. <laughs> the other parameter that we need to get R prime is actually the conductance of the of the wires of the metal material. Okay. This conductance is the conductance of, of the filler, the spacer, the dielectric. Okay, the other parameter we need to get is the resistivity or the conductance of the metals that make up the wire. Now that varies a lot depending on the type of coaxial cable, though. Uh, so, so we're gonna show. You can actually, and we'll derive these uh, equations in later chapters. That's actually the purpose of the course to take a deeper look at capacitance, inductance. And we'll show in later chapters that for this configuration, that. Uh, unit capacitance, capacitance for length. It's related to the permittivity of the spacer. It also depends on the radius, the radii of the inner conductor and the distance to the outer conductor, A and B. So the larger the spacing, that means this, this gets larger as well, the capacitance would go down. So the closer the outer conductor is to the inner conductor, that means this, this, this ratio would decrease, this would get larger. That's the expression for the capacitance. L prime will come, we'll derive this expression when we talk about magnetic fields. Okay. Capacitance comes from our study of electric fields which I think is in chapter five. And then uh, the inductance of magnetic fields is the topic of chapter six, I believe. So, and it's related to perme the permeability of the material. Okay. Again, depends on the spacing of the conductors. And finally, G prime depends on the conductance of our spacer material and also the distance between the two conductors. Okay. Again, the farther apart they are, the greater the distance between them. You would expect greater resistance or smaller conductance, right? And that's what happens here. As B becomes large relative to A, this increases my conductance will go down. There's less leakage between the two conductors. Okay. And R prime is a little more difficult to determine, but the low loss approximation applies 
our our prime actually is dependent on frequency due to, due to effect called the skin effect that we'll see in a later chapter as well. So if you'll notice, at least these equations don't involve frequency at all. But there's a tendency for current at higher frequencies to travel along the outside of the conductor instead of the current being uniformly across the cross section of the conductor. It's called the, the skin effect. And so the R prime depends on frequency. But normally the low loss approximation applies. So the characteristic impedance, we can plug in, you know, the formulas for L prime and C prime. You see, I'm going to get some cancellations here of, of uh, some uh, what's left is just the two pi C, C prime. Oh yeah, that'd be one over two pi. And then I've got the square root, so the one two pi comes out u zero epsilon s, and then natural. I've got the square root of nat of I'll get natural log squared, but then that comes out of the square root well so, as well. So there really is any cancellation, but I do get some combination, I guess. So this is this is the expression for the the characteristic impedance. And then we simplify that a little bit. U zero over the permittivity of my spacer material is mu zero over epsilon r epsilon naught. That's one over the square root of epsilon r times the square root of mu zero over epsilon zero. So mu zero and epsilon zero, they're related by one over the square root of their product is the speed of light. Um, so again, these are these are fixed universal constants, mu zero and epsilon zero. So, and in this case, the square root of, of the ratio turns out to be 377 ohms divided by the square root of epsilon r. So plugging that into this expression, dividing the 377 by 2 pi, um, we get 60 over the square root of epsilon r natural log of b over a. Now again, the, the mistake here in evaluating that is, is plugging in the permittivity and not the relative permittivity. Remember, the relative permittivity is, is a small number between one and three. That's what I've got written on the board here for coax. Okay, it depends on the material, but it's typically between one and 100, regardless of the material. This 377 is called the characteristic impedance of free space, right? It's the square root of mu zero over epsilon zero, which are both constants. So that 377 is also a constant, and we'll, we'll, that'll pop up later on. But that's, that's the characteristic impedance of free space. And then finally, for coax, one over square root of L prime C prime, we had for the Velocity in the low loss approximation here. That's one over square root of the permittivity of the material times mu zero, or again writing epsilon s as er times e zero. I get this result. One over the square root of epsilon zero mu zero is actually the speed of light. So the phase velocity here is less than the speed of light, um, depending on the relative permit, perm, permittivity of, of the material. Um, 
Let's do that. Let's do this this way. Instead of repeating a bunch of equations that are in your book or microstrip, which I just did for coax, but so I could talk about them. That's the one I want. It will be much easier. So the geometry for microstrip, and this is how we make transmission lines on printed circuit boards, or if you're working at high frequencies, then you have to treat your conductors as transmission lines. But here's the geometry on the on the printed circuit board. So here's the conductor and then you've got dielectric material which is the board itself and then a, a copper on the bottom typically forming the ground plane. W is the width of the conductor, the top conductor. Uh, L is the length, and then T is the thickness, and that appears in these equations, as does H, the height between the two conductors. And then you've got the permittivity of the dielectric material. Um, the permeability, again, is, is, is mu zero. And then here, it, it's very complex to analyze this because the electric field is not just confined to the area between the conductor and the ground plane, whereas for coaxial cable, it's typically confined to the coax, but you also have electric and magnetic field lines that are in the surrounding free space. But in the, but you can come up with equations for the characteristic impedance which are relatively nasty to evaluate on your calculator. If you're, if you're good with MATLAB or Octave, it's certainly easy to program these in. But epsilon r is the relative permittivity of the dielectric material. W prime is approximately W, the width between the two conductors. And then the other thing you have in here is this, this phi, which is again related to the width, the height, and the, and the relative permittivity permittivity of the material. So this is what you call an empirical equation. So instead of, like in the previous case of the coax, we'll, we'll derive those equations from, uh, from theory, from our study of electric and magnetic fields. This one is typically, you know, you take measurements and then try to come up with an equation that matches your measurements. Having some understanding that, you know, the characteristic impedance depends on the width and the height and things like that and then trying your best to come up with some sort of equation to model that so it's typically done you know in a, in a research lab coming up with this equation and then similarly for our phase velocity we come up with an expression for beta here's beta for a, a plane wave in free space so what they do for the microstrip is say beta is actually beta zero, the free space beta, times the square root of this effective epsilon r. It's not just epsilon r, but again, because you've got proper, you've got waves not only in the material, but also in free space, and free space has an, uh, an epsilon r of one. So this effective epsilon r is really the average between the relative permitti permittivity of the material and free space. But then I think that's that's the equations you need 
I think the homework problems, there aren't any with microstrip. You can thank me because these equations are pretty nasty, right? But there are a couple problems working with the coaxial cable. So again, the, the phase velocity here is less than the speed of light. If we find something that's faster than the speed of light, we've, we've got something. So, all right, that's it.